Yeah, welcome everybody to the community call of KCP, March 15th. We have an agenda with a couple of items. Um, I guess we will skip the first one for the moment and move that to the, to the, to the end. I'm not sure, Paul, do you, should we do that first or should we first talk about the technical topics? Yeah, let's start with the technical topics. All right, so then I give the voice to Jason. He has two topics there. Uh, yeah, I guess not a lot of uh, not a lot of discussion, I think, but there was some chatter in the Slack this morning that I wanted to uh, advertise here, which was we're going to, as part of P prototype three, we're going to have a static deployment YAML for Synker installation. Static is maybe I should have put that in air quotes. Uh, it's going to be a temp a, a a YAML document in the in the repo somewhere that as part of installation of the syncer, you have to replace some strings with some other strings to point at the right KCP address, put in the uh, certificate data, and specify your cluster name. Uh, but it's not going to be generated. It's not going to be generated uh, in any KCP code. It's going to be some YAML you take off the shelf out of the repo, make some changes, and, and uh, apply. And then that sets up the syncer to connect the KCP and do uh, it's magic. Uh, there's also some discussion about trying to determine automatically what resources that should be synced to clusters. Um, and TLDR, we decided to push it to P4 or possibly later. Um, but that was a discussion of stuff that I can go into more detail on if people are interested in it. Um, but for now, we're just going to sync whole namespaces, whether or not those resources in those namespaces are actually used including secrets, including service accounts, et cetera. Yeah, just one comment. Um, the Synker will know about like deployments, for example. So we are already dependent on certain types and knowledge about them because service accounts, that's the topic coming later. To mount them, you have to modify a deployment specs, pod specs, basically. So there's knowledge about that. So we could use that knowledge as well to um, sync only those secrets, especially secrets are important, those which are referenced. So right, I think, a secret, yeah. I think there's definitely a lot more smart stuff we could do and we won't do it until P4. Yeah, I mean, not before P4. So yeah. virtual workspace API server basically is the enabler for yeah. anything yeah. security-wise in this direction, yeah. Questions, comments about those topics? I have questions about the, the jamming thing because I was the one that I said the question. The thing is, the, the jamming requires the user to set different parameters. So one is the, the queue conflict, okay? That's, that's easy. The other is these resources is because you need to create a, an airbag for all these resources. Is, what resources should we put in this channel for it back? So we, there was a discussion um, a few days back last week, I think at the end of the week. So the, the, the medium term vision is that there is something in the API, in the workspace where the workload cluster objects are created, something which tells the synker and other actors which resources should be synced. So I think we use the name um, thing external thing resource set or something like that. So there's, there will be an object which tells you those are the four objects or the four um, GVRs group version of resources which should be synced. And then whatever we use medium long term to deploy the syncer can then create roles and role bindings and all of that. That's, but it's it's not for P3 and it's probably also not for P4. Um, for, after now, that, for, now, for now, it's just a sensible list, deployment, secrets, compact maps, service accounts, I don't know, something like that. Okay, I use the common, I put the common one. Okay, and the, the other question is the syncer arguments. I mean, because I don't really know. For the syncer arguments, which are the syncer arguments that we want for this 
default deployment, this default camera. What do you mean for for what uh, reason? You think by default? Uh, uh, by default, so you have to create a deployment for deploying the sinker on the big cluster, and this deployment has some arguments that are cluster cluster ID from kubeconfig, that is the kubeconfig that we get, and this has another option that is from cluster. So, should I make up these variables, or is this part of something that the user should provide? So I think it's mostly provided by the user. So there's a cube config which you create in the secret. Um, okay. The logical cluster name is the workspace where the works where the workload cluster object should be created. So it's one workspace which is, I mean, it's selected by the user deploying the sinker. Okay. At the moment, just one. In the future, there will be more. Like we will abstract workload cluster into something like location. And this is then shared over multiple workspaces. But this again is medium term, it's not nothing for P3 and P4. At the moment, one cluster name selected by the user. Okay. Then uh, I don't have more questions. Those are the the pieces that I was missing. Thank you. I have a quick question related to this. Um, we're registering a cluster, we're running a pulse sinker. How does the, um, what's it called? Like there's, we're not just like synchronizing things, we're also um, API import. Negotiating there's a relationship APIs, between, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like how is that handled in the case of the sinker running outside of KCP? Am I missing something? I guess there's again a short term solution, which I'm also not completely sure of. Medium term, there will be an API to provide discovery information. Like there's another object where the thinker will publish the schemas, and then the negotiation machine will restart and do all of the things it does. Short term, that, short that's term, not for P3, right? right? That's like the. Yeah, no, exactly. That's not for that's P3. P4, okay. P5. Okay. But short, no short term, I also have a question mark. Um, who will get discovery and doesn't this need access to a P cluster? Like the CID puller is the name, I think. The, the sinker can talk to its local cluster and get all of the, all of the types on its local cluster and then send those to the KCP, right? Is this today or is this? No, 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 this isn't today. Okay. So today we will have a CID puller manually called. Um, yes, I think so. Okay. Important, but I think it's, it's yeah. fine. So it's, it's one thing we, we know we will fix, but in P3, it's just like that. I thought we were, I thought the, um, API resource bit that the cluster controller and sinker manager spin up sets up importing CRDs. It, it, I don't know if that's if you have auto publish APIs turned on, but definitely pull stuff in. Yeah, yeah, sure. But that was mainly related to the fact that all the syncing and the sinker bootstrapping was managed centrally from the cluster controller. So of course, that's so probably... when that goes away, we'll need to revisit. Yes, surely. I mean, we'll need to revisit uh, with the external sync stuff, which is mainly um, something built on top of the basic API bindings. But for now, in the intermediate situation uh, where we have external sinkers and we don't have that, probably we have to pull by hand. Yeah. So it sounds like we should have a modeling session, design session in a week plus to talk through that. What's our plan? Yeah, well, very good question. I think nobody thought about that. No. Go me. Work, work, work.
All right, anything else about this topic or one of Jason's two topics? Otherwise, I will quickly talk about service accounts. So with the help of a number of people, we have service accounts merged, which means controllers are running. So you can create service accounts, you get secrets with tokens, all of that is done. Authentication works. Um, semantics is basically like in cube, but there's nothing like cross workspace authorization. Service accounts always apply to the workspace they are defined in. This doesn't have to be like that forever. We can talk about extensions, but it's like that for now. And about membership or access to, to an org, those service accounts automatically implicitly get org access. So nothing to do like holes in the root workspace, nothing to do like that. Service accounts just work automatically in their workspace, nowhere else. And ongoing work, so Joachim is working on syncing them into the P cluster, so this is not done, so you cannot deploy um, pods, deployments, whatever, which use them, but hopefully we will see that very soon. That's all about service accounts from my side. And, and Stefan, I just want to double check because this is one of those like fundamental things that it's always better to ask rather than let an assumption go untested, which would be, we still don't really think that the key goal of KCP's workload mindset is to run controllers on underlying clusters, but we very much want to ensure that all workloads running on physical clusters have a connection to a high level service account that could be part of larger systems of identity and authorization, which in practice are probably gonna behave a lot like a cube service account, but the, the fundamental goal is not trying to get a controller running by doing magic for them. That's like a 1% case, it's not our primary goal. It should be possible, but it's not what we're designing service accounts for. Would you disagree with any bit of that? I saw your face moving as you as I was I talking. Would disagree with that, but maybe I don't have the same vision you do yet. I, the goal of the goal of cube was we were like, oh, we made service accounts magic and then people use them to deeply couple workloads to the cluster they're on. KCP workload service transparent multi-cluster does not couple workloads to the cluster they're on. The next question then is, are we deeply coupling controller work? Like, is the goal of, KCP, of KCP's transparent multi-cluster to run workloads? Yes. Is it to run controller workloads 1% of the time? How much mental time are we spending? Like, it's nice and it's convenient to do magic service account authorization and authentication, but is it the same problem that it is on cube with operators and controllers and those patterns? I would probably say no. So maybe we can just, we can do a follow up somewhere else, but I, I want to make sure we're not over pivoting and accidentally doing the coupling. That was a, that's a problem and led to some of the cube problems without thinking through why we're doing it. And what else would we use? I mean, this is a topic for a different discussion, but I, I certainly have opinions on that and I'd like to, Service accounts, are later. service accounts are really important. A service account is for a service and the identity for workload, super important. The magic that makes controllers loop back to their own cluster and work automatically was accidental in Cube and has a whole bunch of side effects that are non-desirable from a security, reliability, tenancy, isolation perspective. Before we reproduce that, magically automatically in kcp we should think about it so let's, well we can do a follow-up right right, right. i mean, I mean the, the, the magic part is what i like you have to have a persistent ability to access the cluster i mean bound tokens are really only an internal thing that are really hard to work for outside actors that's my only comment but yeah let's talk more yeah jason you had the hand up i think I uh, raised my hand and lowered it because I saw a rat hole opening underneath me. But I think I, I think we've mostly um, said everything that I was going to say. Yeah, Clayton, if you can start a meeting someday, maybe not this week, but next week or so, and start discussing the vision and where we want to go, would 
be helpful. I think the magic, everybody has question marks, which kind of magic we don't want. So I, I mean, I, I would say the current state is already recorded in the use cases in the transparent multi-cluster design doc. So adding net new above that is the caution. And if right. we have a disconnect between what we're implementing and what those docs say today, that's just a good chance for us to be like, are we actually following the doc? Are we saying there's a doc, but we don't actually agree on the key points because the doc's not clear. Or, yeah. We need to go debate it more. Sounds good. All right, I don't see hands. You postpone to another meeting, maybe to discuss this deeper. All right, uh, next one, Steve, CLDB, magic, not magic, but. Uh, cool. Super quick updates. Um, so we, uh, we're basically passing all tests um, up through EDE. Uh, there's patches in Core Cube to enable new storage. There's patches in like the integration stuff. There's patches in KeyBDM so you can run a, uh, a cluster doing this. Um, the next steps for me are uh, I'm currently working around a little bit of goofiness in the CRDB watch stream and uh, I'm in the process of doing this I found a quite a large number of things in cube itself where uh, people were like bending the rules of the API while writing tests and stuff and so those tests obviously broke uh, when, when I redid the API um, so there's a lot of stuff that's merged upstream I'm going to try to rebase my changes on like vanilla upstream cube um, just to get the minimal uh, and then I will also try to get a minimal PR against our fork. Um, and then I am uh, brain dumping and knowledge sharing with Jason. So hopefully we'll be getting some reviews in and then actually getting getting some code merged into somewhere. I have a comment, Steve, we briefly chatted about that. Rebase is coming like one twenty fourth end of the month, I think, something like that. So I guess we want those patches. And I suggested before, maybe we should rethink how we do rebases or at least identify interdependent carry patches and those which don't depend on each other. Like we have generic control plane. It's a pretty big patch or a couple of them. And then we have all the things around logical clusters those two things are not completely separate, but they are mostly orthogonal. And then the next thing will be a CIDB, right? Cockroach. So yeah, maybe and... we should have patch sets or something and go step by step, like one patch set by patch set. I agree. Um, I think it, it would be a good time to do it. Um, I think m mostly it is completely orthogonal. Um, I imagine just based on like mucking around with the code base, we need to do a little bit better on hygiene up there. Like there's a lot of stuff that was was put in um, like a year and a half ago that, you know, the focus was speed. And right now it, it means that our KCP fork doesn't compile. Um, so it might be good to revisit all the patches. I think the next victim doing the rebase has to sort them. And then we have to to look through the changes which we need and which we don't, and maybe make a plan which things we want to get rid of for upstream. That's the moment, basically, to rethink like that. Like me. Yeah, and at least on my, my fork of our fork, <laughs> um, there's been a bunch of stabilizing I had to do to make things actually run and, and test uh, green and whatnot. I'm not sure like what order. Like I don't want to pile extra stuff on top of the rebase. Like it shouldn't be whoever's rebasing. Okay, also now fix all these problems. Um, so I'm I'm open to thoughts on how to like intelligently get this stuff together. And um, maybe like update. what small subset of tests we could actually run in CI for, for that work. Status update, you, you tried to fix things in our fork or where are you with I, that? I haven't merged anything yet, but like, so so my fork, my PR up branch um, is functional. Andy? Okay. 
Uh, yeah, I agree with you. There's a lot of stuff that needs to be done to improve the hygiene. Um, totally happy to come up with a plan for reorganizing commits and grouping things together and like what what rebases should look like going forward. Um, I'm off next week, but would certainly entertain talking about it when I'm back. Yeah, I think that gives us time before the next one lands, right? End of March is a good time, right? It's end of March or end of April? It's March, right? March, yeah. March, so that's a good timing for us, actually. Cool. Thank you. All right. So, Nick, I postpone your topic to, to the real end, so we can go to the P4 scope discussion first. All right. So, Paul, P4. Mm -hmm. Cool. So, March 18th is the end of P3, so, uh, which is awesome. We're coming up on that pretty quick at the end of this week. It's time to start talking about our themes for P4 and deciding what we want to focus on there. Um, I wanted to proposed to the group first, just kind of based on some of the feedback that I've seen and uh, how P2 and P3 has gone, that rather than try and scatter our focus and make a, a little bit of progress on a, a bunch of different areas, we start focusing on maybe swarming towards a single area and getting that really to a state that we feel good about. Um, so if the group likes that sort of idea, I think there's a, a couple things that we can pick as those topics, but I also want to suggest that we take advantage of our scheduling and how we uh, moved P3 to be on the 18th, giving us a bigger iteration for P4 and provide ourselves a little bit of breathing room on our scoping and design work for P4 by taking maybe uh, next week and say maybe to, to like the 28th to actually scope out and design what we do decide on on working on. So that's where I wanted to start the conversation and, and find out if people like the idea of narrowing scope and getting something to a, a, a better state, or if we wanted to continue a, a lot of focus areas at once. I like the idea of trying to focus on things. Uh, I think that there's a lot of areas that we could um, spread ourselves in the code base. And rather than doing that, um, trying to clean up some tech debt and improve the user experience um, or for a small subset of things like transparent multi-cluster and uh, some evolution with APIs, and I think that would be good. All right, well, if, if people don't feel too strongly about it, that my suggestion was going to be that we pick as our topic, transparent multi-cluster, and really feel good about the story we can tell around transparent multi-cluster, and also our repo hygiene and engagement. Like, what do people first see? How do they get involved in KCP? And what's that, that three sentence message that we need them to understand at the end of P4 so that they're like, yeah, I get it. I think TMC is so central. If the experience is bad, this is, it's a blocker for the project. So we should get this right. Stephane, including all the negotiation stuff and um it's the killer app but you don't want it to be a dead killer app um and i think that's like the it doesn't have to be perfect but it has to be it has to show the promise of the of the pitch do you now are, we, are there things that we can prune off out of that that are hidden details that we can change later like I, we've talked a lot about this over the the last month or so but like it has to appear killer app. It doesn't actually have to be killer implementation. Yeah, the, the, um, I mean, we get every day, every morning, I see questions from people trying it and they fail by, I mean, the, the list of resources is, it's always there. Like people get that wrong. This should be hidden from users, for example. It should, I mean, we should say deployments and replica sets and X, Y, Z work, and they should work out of the box. 
this kind of experience. If X, Y, Z works and A, B, C doesn't, and we document that, that's fine. Along the same lines and slightly bigger in scope than that is, I've heard a lot of people uh, who want webhooks and who want uh, pod exec and pod logs. And I, I realize those are you know, massively huger issues than, than hard coding the list of resources that work. But I think we need to at least have an answer to those questions that is better than the answer we have now. The answer we have now is like, yeah, we know we need it eventually. We have a vague idea of how to do it. Uh, I think we need to start nailing that down. Yeah. That's gonna be I think the we, next, have, the next big we have, have ideas about that. And we have to just, I mean, this is sweet prototyping, just build yeah. it. Even if not perfect, but we have to move from hand waving to something real. Okay, it, it sounds like folks are pretty comfortable focusing on whatever parts of transparent multi cluster we, we want to prove out and, and that could be uh, superficial if we need it to be for some areas and have a deeper implementation for others. And just to be clear, I, I don't think that means that we don't make progress in other areas. We've got a, a lot of variety of contributors that are on the team that have different focuses they want to do, which is perfectly fine. Um, I think we need to, to actually pick off the pieces of TMC that we agree on. And I'd like to suggest that uh, by the 29th, which is in two weeks, we're able to review designs of what we've picked off. So that, that means we have this week to finish up uh, prototype three, and we have about uh, a week and a day or so to actually sketch out those, those issues scope them out with with the actual uh, task that we'll complete and and probably have some sort of script sketch for what we want to show um, if that's reasonable then we could also target the 22nd of april as a four weeks of coding and then have some sort of review on the the 26th call if, if we like that which hopefully allows us to glide into the, the 29th end of prototype a little bit smoother than we have in some of these past ones. Um, one addition, so if we use the week next week and basically the week after as well, right? For discussing should, I mean, Everybody who wants to propose a topic, you should have design sessions, like one hour sessions or something like that. So if you are thinking about a topic, like I mean this pot exact topic, somebody who is uh, enthusiastic about that, wants to work on that, schedule a session. We have a number of days, number of afternoons, so we should talk through those topics and find designs which then can be implemented in the remaining four weeks. Would it be helpful or uh, anti-helpful to open an issue for design pod exec or design, you know, design pod logs stuff and just get people's thoughts and, you know, uh, vague high level ideas. And then from that, take a design, I could probably like come up with a design, but I want to make sure that everybody everybody's uh, interests are involved in that. And same with webhook. I mean, it's, it's not unique to that one, but should we start issues now so that we can start collecting ideas and input? Or is that anti-helpful at this time? I'd love to see those sorts of things. Oh, we can close them out when we've got everything scoped and we're good. Uh, I mean, we already have like one or two issues related to logs and whatnot, I think a Google Doc with some design ideas um, would maybe work a little bit better and you can just link to it that way. Sounds good. Paul, can you create a doc maybe where we collect the uh, major themes, like the big questions, 
And if we then fan out to separate docs, we can link them there, but to have a starting point. Yeah, we can use the work packages doc to brainstorm just the, the big bullets and then let's link into any detailed designs and issues that we have from there. Um, I've tried to capture what we've mentioned so far in that doc as well. All right, so you see it here. Everybody, please join that talk, add your topics, and then we can start design sessions next week, the week after. Sounds like a plan, I think. All right, Paul, I would switch to the next topic if you are fine with that. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you, everyone. So before Nick get a chance, here are the topics, the new issues which have no milestone and have been created in the last week. So let's go through them. There are not so many, which is good. So we make progress, it seems. Um, first one is API inheritance, test flag, Andy. Yeah, it just it showed up in one of my PRs in one of the ED multiple runs. So um, I haven't looked at it yet, uh, but I, I will be changing that end-to-end -end test as part of um, my API binding controller work. So uh, if it shows up a lot, it's probably worth looking at in the immediate term, but uh, probably not for the long term since I'm going to be changing the test up. So, I mean, we can put it for prototype three and uh, one way or another, hopefully it will get resolved. If it happens, let's assign it. Yeah, I've only seen it once. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we had a couple of issues last week, beginning of this, this week. Everybody who writes tests, please be aware. We have controllers doing things. We have informers, which have to be sync in sync to do things. So we need require eventually in many places. That's what we found and fixed in flags, flag PRs. Maybe it's a different or a similar one, I don't know. We will see. Could be. All right. Um, next one, it was a follow up from our auth work in the virtual workspace API server. There was one check missing, which we have in cluster workspace admission namely authorization for that i added a pr so it's nothing big uh, just another subject access review to check that the user can use the works cluster workspace type prs up ready for review um yeah, so let's, one, if, if you that. if you've got a pr for it I, I think like feel free to just set the milestone you know if, if it's something that you know needs to go into whatever milestone it is, um, you can certainly do that. And then it'll just save a little time. Yeah, I would do. Split apart our single cube config into multiple scan and That probably is a P4 thing. And I, I know there was a question from Kyle that he, I think it was Kyle, um, that came in after I created it. So Stefan, you and I should uh, take a look at that and respond. So I'll put um, part of four on that. Namespace scope lister stone toner logical cluster boundaries doing this calls. Yeah, so that's the meta namespace index funk that doesn't record the cluster name in the key. So that's going to be a big chunk of work to fix. It's probably should get rolled into the scoping work that we eventually need to plan out and get merged. So, um, I think that's something we should try and tackle for prototype yeah. four. Do you know if they are using namespace calls in the back end? Who? Like, is, does a namespace lister 
get fed by a namespaced list and no. name like no, no it just no. uses the indexer and so cache meta namespace index funk needs to be per logical cluster and what you have not. sorry go ahead. what you yeah. have now is basically index buckets which are by namespace correctly but the namespace keys they are not prefixed by workspace so the buckets are big like they're across workspace but inside of each of the buckets of the index everything is unique so it's not bad for get but it's bad for list But it has, it has I know this could be, um, if you do like a namespace scoped cross cluster call the etcd implementation doesn't there's no way to do that so i think you just get cross name like cro i don't even know what you get i didn't know if that was uh, related there's no such thing as a namespace scope cross cluster no. is there it's like technically a possible permutation you can ask for but yeah I don't know what yeah. comes out the other end right now. I think I may have disallowed it at some point. <laughs> That's actually an interesting one, but I haven't heard a concrete use case for it yet. Um, we, I think this is in like the, we're not really good at getting patterns of how people should actually be using this stuff documented. So like that first one I tried for the uh, observability guys, I wanna go back and do that again for a couple of other examples. If someone has a cross workspace namespace scope, use case like I can think of a few off the top of my head like you know system namespaces that just by convention contain a bunch of policy and that controller could read it I just don't know we would probably need some examples of it but that's a good one though Steve to also tie into our access patterns doc like say hey we thought about this but we don't have a use case for it yet so we're not worried about it um yeah and that's the sort of thing that's really expensive with CD right it, it, it's, it's expensive for a databases two um but it actually in even in etcd it is actually not that expensive if you can set up the chunk scanning effectively so oh yeah i mean i think just because it's a prefix scan like you end up going one level higher up on the prefix and then but you, but if you're chunking you ought actually get some of those benefits back because you can deliver the chunks in in phase so it might actually not be that bad um, so mm -hmm. if anybody has that use case though bring it up and slack or something so workspace deletion is similar right yes you have it, to go by resource and then so we have many sub ranges in the key space right yeah you're right so that's actually one so i'll put that into access patterns um i actually it's tough because like we're struggling to find like we we have use cases scattered across a couple places and i was trying to come up with bigger use cases and then we have like controller access patterns which exist in the design docs for like the database stuff um so like i do think the canonical place kind of is at the storage layer what access patterns you can support or choose to support defines the shape of the data model you need and data is truth um but i think we're a little weak today about coming up with them and then getting them all in the same spot so someone can go find them. So I'll, I'll, maybe we start with putting them in the access patterns section of storage right now, which is in the um, sharding design doc. So I'll, I'll make that note, Stefan. Is there any other anybody can think of? Just for reference, this is what I mean by the access patterns uh, link. Peyton, um, that's the topic of listing one GBR, but just one specific resource schema. That might be also related. Yeah, yeah. Without rewriting on schema change, obviously. So. Yep. And I don't know that we have that one captured. We have a little bit more general so i'll put that one under as well okay that's good thanks kubectl kcp workspace current in root is broken i think david commented already is david here i think yes just, sure. I... just no parent right that was the reason uh yeah if, re if you refresh i think i linked that to the peer i created today 
Okay. Um, yeah, and that was fixed in the context of a more general okay. cleanup. Can you move over to, can you move the issue to P3 then? Uh, yeah, yes. A reminder for the PRs too. Like if you open up a PR, you expect it to get merged, um, please set the milestone on that also. Oh, I do. Need a way to consistently deploy a KCP server plus kind clusters for develop test demo. Oh. Mao? Is there sorry, is there a question? No, it's it's your issue. It's the last one which is shared. Uh -huh. Six seven four. I mean the goal for me is is enabling a way to deploy um, KCP with some P clusters with kind because we actually need to validate controller interaction. And have it be consistent. So you just run a command so that we can use that in E2E. We can use that for development. We use that for demoing. But I mean, that's kind of riffing on like, we've had previous conversations about like, yeah, the demo script is in bash and that's hard to maintain. So, I mean, I, explicitly in that issue, it's like, we would like something in Golang, please. I mean, yeah, it's a little bit more expensive initially, but we could actually maintain it over time. It's easier to do cross-platform, all that jazz. And we have shared fixtures, right? This fits to that because then it's okay to start up in some seconds. And Yeah, I mean, the way that I'm yeah. like, we have shared fixture in for most of our tests today, but what that implies is nothing unless you run a persistent server because we don't have a good we have to compose a test suite and be able to to be able to do test managed fixture but it's really easy to do persistent fixture except that you have to be able to start whatever you're going to be targeting so currently i know the command line invocation that will produce a kcp server compatible for testing and it's not like it's hard but it definitely should be captured and be repeatable by everybody rather than just passing passing off like magic strings to people so we have one epic called registration of workload clusters. This was would benefit, right? Because we need it basically. We have to deploy something. Otherwise, we ha don't have an end-to-end -end test. Yeah. And I mean, initially it's like we're gonna use kind, but I mean I could see that, you know, expanding to use actual clusters of some kind somewhere else. It's it's just like right. having having an interface to get things you can develop and test against that are gonna be consistent and unsurprising. Do you want to spec out a quick sketch of like what you'd expect the Go uh, struct interfaces to look like and what you might want from a command line? And then we can put, you know, help wanted on there. Um, sure. I mean, to me, I care. I don't really care about the internals. I just want like, given kcp and kind you know binaries available in the command line give me something yeah um so and, and expose you, the configuration a, in a way that's consumable you have a what i would say is a a minimal desired ux in mind like you, you have an experience and an outcome that you're looking for so at the very least um if you can sketch out what you want the command line to look like or how people would do this, then um, somebody can go implement it. I, I think it's a little uh, not so it's not quite so tangible with what's uh, in the description here, if that makes sense. Sure. Thanks. I think that's it for our open issues. Let's move back to the agenda. All right, so I think that's a chance to for Nick now for the topic at the end. Nearly the end, Paul has another one. Uh, yeah, oh, go ahead. Uh, is, is it my turn, Paul? Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's your turn, so just go ahead. Okay, yeah, um, so I, I was uh, in the, context of how something like OLM or uh, if people have been following RecPack things that like um, manage uh, control plane updates or upgrades over time. Um, I, 
haven't seen this use case uh, in any of the docs or issues that I've seen so far. Um, it's essentially pivoting between um, logical clusters, or you can even like hang it off workspaces. Uh, it would be really convenient um, to be able to spin up a new logical cluster um, so that we can upgrade uh, things that change the control plane. Like let's say um, CRDs, API services, uh, et cetera, before um, like committing to that change for the actual workloads or on the cluster. Um, who, who's the as a, a, a person doing that? Are you as a KCP operator? Are you as a organization admin or something like that? Or some service? I as, I as a service, I as some meta operator that manages um, upgrades of a set of, uh, let's just say CRDs on the control plane, right? So you're a service team and you want to roll out multiple changes, like meta operator assumes that the use, like what's the use case for the meta operator? I think that's the kind of question that I've wanted. Uh, Okay, let's say I had a configuration that says here here is all the the operators that I want to cluster, and here is all the versions. Like, um, and those operators come with a bunch of uh, CRDs and changes to the control plane. Um, and I uh, have a when I change that configuration, what I expect to happen is uh, an upgrade. Right. Um, I'm basically describing like OLM or uh, CBO, but operating over KCP clusters and pivoting between KCP clusters instead of just like changing um, the cluster that they exist on. Uh, and the reason is like I want to kind of avoid. Um, well, I'll I'll uh, I'll stop there. Andy, there's a con there's a connection to API exports, I guess. Maybe Andy, that's what you want to talk about. You raised your hand, I think. Yeah, I think, Nick, we should talk later. Um, OK. Because uh, Stefan and I and others have been working on uh, API exports, API imports, so to speak, API, which we're calling API bindings, and then being able to evolve a, a schema over time. So if you've got a CRD and it looks like some shape and then you add some fields you move some stuff around we want to be able to make those changes identifiable assuming we can uh, automate figuring out what's compatible and what's not and we want to allow um, controllers service providers operators whatever you want to call them that um, own reconciling those those custom resources we want to make it so that they can deal with evolutions as well so we should probably talk separately through some of your use cases and like what your vision looks like and how that meshes or not with where we're trying to do uh what we're trying to do with the api export and resource scheme evolution yeah and and actually like, okay. so, nick this might be something that we should and andy like this is something we can pull up in in the docs that you have like to a more high level is like I think we could say something even today, which is like, if you say the word operator, it doesn't mean anything in the KCP context. We're, yeah. trying, to, we're trying to go back to like saying like, operator is a pattern that lots of people bring their own assumptions to. We're trying to say like services, yeah, sure. by APIs, controllers that run them, infrastructure that makes rolling out changes to service APIs easier because a API that's exposed in a workspace. Yeah you know, is, is you're consuming it, you just expect that API contract to be honored, the mechanics are hidden. And then there's a underdeveloped set of concepts past that, because we were kind of spending yeah. a bunch of time, as Andy's saying, like focused on those concepts. Uh, if there's additional use cases for evolution of, like evolving APIs on a cluster, one person assumes they know how to evolve all those APIs. There's a fundamentally different assumption, I think, that we're saying, which is actually, no, most admins of a cluster have no idea how to evolve those APIs, and they're just hoping mm -hmm. 
that if upgrades are delivered that Red Hat or the operator team knew how to do that. I think we're trying yeah. to switch that responsibility, which is the person rolling out the changes is accountable for making sure that those APIs rolled out. Doesn't mean that we might not have that use case, which is someone in bulk wants to go trigger a bunch of rollouts of new APIs because a vendor or a provider has done it. But we're trying to start from the assumption that the team rolling out that API is responsible and accountable in the racy sense to yeah. making that successful, not the vendor. And I, the vendor might be that team and the vendor might want those tools. So yeah, like getting getting working with Andy will be great. And then we should maybe capture that as a high level assumption in the stuff you have, Andy, like as a principle or something. The, the switch of the CID schema is not atomic across the whole KCP fleet. That's, I think, the basic, the core idea. But it's a deployment process. And, and yeah. technically, it's, it's not atomic in a cube cluster either. And it is that is a fundamental <laughs> problem we are trying to address yeah. with careful understanding of the use cases and stuff, which is why the use cases are so important. Yeah, so um, given that, let me, let me just reframe this, because I'm going to be on vacation for the next Two days or so, um, so I won't be able to like follow up with you guys uh, until Friday. Um, to rephrase in the terminology and the the viewpoint that you just gave, um, let's say I view a logical cluster as a just a setup configuration, like a like a immutable deployment of everything, including um, APIs, controllers, deployments, like all the resources um, that make up that cluster. And what I want to do is upgrade from one set of configuration that defines my entire cluster to another set of configuration that defines my other cluster. And it seems to me like KCP provides a really unique opportunity because spinning up a new cluster to pivot to um, is now something that's possible much more cheaply. Um, and so it's like, think about, uh, the analogy for uh, a deployment to a pod, this would be like between logical clusters, if that makes sense. Um, Maybe, and there's this, this is similar to folks, some things we've talked about, you know, in the long run, the machinery of this should enable potentially within a given cube cluster, lots of logical little clusters for different layers of security. Yeah. Like you could imagine a logical cluster for the infrastructure that runs on the control planes is physically un it is impossible for an end user who's not authorized to access that to even be able to see the deployment services that comprise a control plane on a self-hosted cluster for example they would you know end users might never even see that in that mental model some of what you're describing the use case you've described is i want to i want to be able to look at the two different views before and then figure out how to test between them on a all resources sense, not on a per resource sense, because what we described mm -hmm. was yep. a per resource or set of resources mindset. You're describing a responsibility of it's the user deciding to do a bunch of upgrades at the same time yeah. of a set of config. And they want to do those at the same time because they understand how all those resources are used together. So like a team, mm -hmm. maybe the way I'd use this in the KCP sense would be a team wants to is about to take an outage period or they're at an outage window and they want to upgrade all of the op, the service implementations at the same time because they want to minimize their outage window. So like they're looking at a logical cluster, they've got some services, some deployments, some magic foos, some magic bars, magic foo and magic bar have a V2. And they're like, yep, I want to work through and accelerate doing all of these upgrades at once and then I want to cut back. So it's a blue green dependency mm -hmm. upgrade. So I think that yep. and it's kind of what we're saying is like, I want to change all my dependencies. I somebody's provided them. I need to test them. How could I test them together so that I don't have to do a bunch of iterative tests in production? Like I want an ability to blue green a whole config workspace. What are the implications of that? What would the use cases be? Yeah, it's it's like um, I want to view uh, if I view each one of these things as a graph, um, and then there's like a, a hypergraph connecting them. Um, I want to do it all 
uh, in a single, like abstract it so it seems atomic for all the configurations since I, I can't know what those, uh, those subgraphs, all those edges contain um, because we don't have all that information. Like, I don't know if, if adding a, a, a deployment here will affect a deployment in another namespace um, for whatever reason uh, until I actually do it, if that makes sense. Sorry. So I'm just um, good play, I, good with, uh, agreeing. Where's a good place to record that? Clayton, is there a doc where you can? Uh, I, it's such a use case. Andy and I, I'll chat with Andy afterwards and we can figure out, like, because I think there's a couple of use cases that have been discussed in various spots, but just making sure we can write it down in, in language. Right, thanks. We've got the last comment from Paul, which is maybe just a reminder, Paul. Yeah, we can we can postpone that one till next time. I've just seen a, a couple requests this past week about whether or not we need to continue updating prototype two pieces and yeah. how we can make sure that we use what we've already done to make sure we're not breaking things we're currently doing. So that that gets what, into the Maru's conversation about. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe it's something we can start. I mean one plan is to have smaller demos. So maybe we can start this one and just do it. Yeah. Sounds good. All right, last minute. Any other topics, questions, comments? If not, and everybody gets back 48 seconds or something like that. Thank you, everybody. See you next week.